Steve Kennard, Republican candidate for Texas House District 70. Welcome to Ion Politics. Thanks so much, Jack. Appreciate you having me on. So why should voters elect you over the Democratic incumbent, Mihaela Plisa? Sure, so the first thing I like to tell people is I'm a proud native Texan, born and raised in Dallas, and I'm really not a politician by background. I'm an entrepreneur, was part of starting an oil and gas company. I'm a father, raising three young kids in this district, and I didn't see this turn of life coming, but I felt called to step up and give a voice to our community, which is fundamentally a pro-family, pro-business community. I think our current representative has strayed far from that path and is representing more of an extremist wing of the Democrat Party. I think it's out of touch with the values of Collin County. And I've he I'm hearing that every day on the campaign trail. This has been a grassroots campaign from the beginning. I embrace that. I love meeting people out in the community. And that's the different kind of approach that we want to take, is represent Collin County and not the external values of this kind of larger far left radical agenda that we see coming into our community. And Governor Abbott told me at the end of July he thinks you're going to flip this seat. Republican. Uh, what, what, what do you say to that? We are going to flip this seat and you know I'll highlight I'm proud to have Governor Greg Abbott's endorsement. Uh, as he rolled out his announcement of those endorsements, I think it's worth highlighting that we were the very first race in the House of Representatives that he highlighted. And I'll tell the people of House District 70, I think it's really a privilege. If you live in the southwest portion of Collin County in House District 70, you know, we really get to set the tone for what kind of society, what kind of Texas we want to hand over to the future generation. There are 150 seats in the House of Representatives. Overwhelmingly, they lean, they tend to lean, either Republican or Democrat. This is a rare, toss-up, really competitive district. That's why the governor recognizes it as that. I think he also recognizes it as an opportunity where fundamentally Collin County wants a pro-family, pro-liberty kind of candidate. That's what I'm bringing, is aligning myself with what the people of Collin County want. We want to prioritize security. We've seen an unacceptable influx due to the border crisis of even Venezuelan gangs that are now being reported as having a, a presence in our community. That shouldn't be partisan. Yeah. Let's prioritize security. This is a purple district. And when I went back and checked the results just from 2022, Governor Abbott did not win this district. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Governor did not win this district. The Attorney General did not win this district. All the Democrats in statewide races at least those three won their races. So why are you so confident you're gonna be able to win? Sure, well look, I think that there's, there's two big differences from last time. The first is, particularly in this race for House District 70, the current representative, my opponent, has a voting record now that is far left and out of touch with the more moderate approach that I think a lot of voters that even maybe supported her last time and which would have expected. You, which votes are you talking about? I, I think most disturbing for me is related to the threat of human trafficking in our community. Just a few weeks ago, in fact, we saw attempted child abductions not far from House District 70. The thoroughfare of I-75 that runs through our district has been an area where the sheriff has uh, has caught and confiscated tremendous amounts of fentanyl and other drugs that are coming through our community. House Bill 800 in the last legislature was a bill that increased the penalties on human trafficking. My opponent voted against it, even though a number of Democrats supported it. I find that to be indefensible. In addition to that, House Bill 7 was the primary bill that was focused on making the needed investments in border security because what happens at the border is what's driving this threat and criminal element in our community here in Collin County. Again, my opponent voted against House Bill 7 and then tries to come up with other ways that supposedly they were working on securing the border, which just doesn't pass the common sense test. We need to move beyond a partisan battle around prioritizing security in our community and make sure that the voters know we are going to do what needs to be done and invest in law enforcement to pursue this criminal element and stop it. Just yesterday, Governor Greg Abbott named the Tren de Aragua gang, a Venezuelan gang, as a terrorist organization. That's what they are. My opponent makes no comment about that, and that's unacceptable. And I want the people to know that these are terrorist organizations. So, In order to solve the problem, first we have to name the problem for what it is. So let me ask you, uh, with regards to border security, the state has spent about $11 billion, a lot of money, um, 
do you think that that is the right amount of money? Do you think more needs to be spent, or is it, you know, are there other needs that the state has to, you know, has to, to do, has to fill? Yeah, well, the first thing I would say about that is we need to continue to apply pressure at the federal level to reimburse the state of Texas for this unacceptable expense that we are having to incur due to the catastrophic failure of the federal government. The problem should have never been there in the first place. The second part of this is that, unfortunately, it's not a problem that is shrinking over time. It continues to grow as we see this crisis at the southern border. And while, of course, we would like to make strategic investments in other areas, such as reducing the property tax burden, which is something I'm very focused on, our first priority has to be security. And we have to make those investments. So I do support it. I think that as we continue to fight this threat, this criminal element coming across the border, we can evolve the ways that we make those strategic investments. We can lean on more um, technologies that are coming to bear to reduce the costs of monitoring and surveilling that border. So let's look at that and try to be efficient and not just measure success in terms of the dollars invested, but in the outcome of reducing the gang presence, of returning these criminal um, uh, elements to their country of origin, and empowering our law enforcement to know that we're behind them all the way. Well, as you know, there are a lot of the state bills, uh, as before, uh, is is one of the bills that is tied up in the courts. That's right. And so that's that was the bill that en enabled the state to actually prosecute people who cross the border illegally. Yep. And so I'm wondering, what more do you think the state should be doing to get more bang for its buck that it's not doing? I am a supporter in a designated unit. Right now, as you know, the DPS is the primary um, vehicle through which we, we monitor and secure our border. I am a supporter of an increased investment in a designated Texas border unit that develops this subject matter expertise that has a long-term commitment and a mandate to seek out and eliminate this criminal element wherever it's happening. The border area is most acute, but we're seeing this in Collin County now. And we need an entity that has that kind of mandate and, and that coverage now, to ensure that we combat this. Officers? Yes. So these are these would be licensed peace officers. That is my that is my intention, and that is what I support. Yes. And would they replace DPS troopers that are that have been assigned to the border? Would they replace the national guard? You know, the, the national guard. Yeah, I think there's a discussion to be had around there. It's not logical to duplicate efforts. So I would I would envision that many of the people that are currently engaged in this kind of work could transition over but ultimately the the investment there would expand over time we would bring new people in it's a continuous discussion it has a lot to do also with the involvement support and efficacy of the federal government which should really have been the one that prevented this crisis from ever happening in the first place and so we see a situation where to some degree the goalposts are moving on us where we are reacting to a crisis in real time that is unacceptable and never should have been there in the first place. We've seen it for years now, and irrespective of the commitment or lack thereof, frankly, from the federal government to do their job, we're at a point now where the state of Texas has to boldly let the people know, we are gonna secure our communities. We're not gonna tolerate this anymore. And that's a continuous discussion of how do we best do that? How do we learn from what has worked well and perhaps other areas where we can improve? So let's continue to have that discussion. But first and foremost, the state of Texas is gonna ensure our security if other entities won't. The people deserve that and I know that that's what they expect from us. So we talked about the border. What other top priorities do you have? Two, I'm raising two other top priorities. Look, I'm raising three young kids in this district. I'm raising a daughter. I refuse to be a part of a society that equivocates on the basic truth that men and women are different. I'll tell you going around and talking to people in House District 70, not a single one yet has told me that they support men playing in women's sports. The reality is I wish that we didn't really even have to talk about this. It shouldn't be a partisan matter when we have issues of security, our electrical grid that I'll get to in one minute. But let me be clear, if we can't in the public square stand firm in the simple truth that men and women are different, that women deserve and have a right to private spaces and an opportunity to compete in athletics without men playing in there. 
then we've corrupted, I think, all of the discussion downstream of that. First and foremost, we have to let people know that we are not going to allow womanhood to essentially be erased in our community. I find it unacceptable. I know the people of Collin County don't want this radical transgender agenda, and that's something we're gonna to continue to stand against. Of course, my opponent voted for men and women's sports, and these dangerous experimental transgender mutilations, really, surgeries that are targeting children, there's just not a support for this in our community. The people don't want it. So my opponent is representing the values of George Soros or Planned Parenthood or some other external entity. It's not the people of Collin County. So I want them to make sure that they know that I stand for the family. Parents should, should always be the primary decision makers in moral, religious, and medical decisions for their children. We're gonna continue to lead that way in Texas. That's a big priority for me, making sure that families are empowered and our children are protected. And when I've talked to LGBTQ lawmakers last year, they told me that they feel as if Republicans are targeting their community. What do you say to that? Well, we're not targeting a community, but we are standing firm in the truth that men and women are different. You cannot simply erase that and, and replace it with, with frankly nonsense that when does a man become a woman? How, when, and where? Why is that allowed? This doesn't stand up to the common sense test. We're not out here trying to target anyone, but we are going to stand firm in that truth. I don't find that as something where it's about being against a particular person. If you're a, a, a law-abiding adult, I'm not trying to, to tell you what you should or shouldn't do in your private home, but I am going to tell you that you cannot invade the private spaces of women, of biological women. That's unacceptable. And it sends, I think, a really corrosive and demeaning message to young girls to tell them, well, you really don't get a chance now because you're gonna have men competing in sports with you. It's, it's not right, it's not fair. It's completely out of touch with the values of the people of Collin County. I wanted to ask you about public education. There's a lot of discussion well, that. was number three, that. so let's talk okay, about Okay, all right, so, <laughs> well, let me give you the opportunity to then to talk about what makes public education a priority for you. Education is the number one investment our state makes. I think that is exactly where it should be. Investing in the future generation is the best investment that we can make. What I want to talk about for a minute, though, and I think, frankly, we could have a whole debate just about this issue because there's tremendous misunderstanding here. We need to reject this false dichotomy that's going on right now, wherein you have to choose between being for the family or for public education, for public schools. I reject that entirely, but I will say that my primary focus in terms of being a representative for the people of Collin County is to invest in education by investing in the student and empowering those families to have a choice and create a marketplace of ideas that delivers the best solution for them. I think that in many cases, and most, they're going to choose to send their kids to the school that they're going to right now, which overwhelmingly is going to be Plano ISD, Allen ISD, and Frisco ISD, which are the three that are in House District 70. They're neighborhood schools. I think that's great. I think that's great. But here's the fundamental question we have to ask ourselves. Are you best served by a government monopoly or by a marketplace of ideas? There is no other area of society where people willingly disenfranchise themselves by saying, I, I forsake all other options. It just doesn't make sense. And in addition to that, when you have competition, the services to the end user, families, and most importantly, students, get better through that process of competition. Here's the reality. In the last session, we had a bill that would have significantly increased funding. My opponent voted against it because they prioritized government control over the families. We can do all of it. We can invest boldly in education. That's what I believe in. My wife was a teacher uh, years ago. I am a firm supporter of paying teachers more. We've gone down a path of kind of this divisive rhetoric, and I just reject that entirely. We're gonna invest in education and fund our local schools. Okay, so what you're talking about is taxpayer-funded education savings accounts. Yes, sir. School choice. Yes, sir. You support that? I support that. And so I'm wondering, are you saying that you support that and increasing money to public schools. Yes. And 
should the, because I mean, Plano ISD and a whole bunch of school districts around our area, and we're in a high growth area. Yeah. And yet, they've had to shut down schools yeah. uh, because uh, they've had deficit budgets. Right. And so I'm wondering, um, talk to me about that problem because yeah. that's a serious issue. People were very unhappy about schools having to close, their neighborhood schools having to close. What's the solution? So I think the first thing we have to recognize, and this isn't Plano ISD's fault particularly, is that birth rates are lower. This district was built at a time when birth rates are higher, most of the facilities. Now they're just lower. That's factually true. I don't think that's disputed. And number two, the growth has primarily moved further north to other communities where you have new build areas. And so the attendance is lower through that. And then yes, more people are choosing other options already for their kids, but this is an endemic problem or a structural problem, I should say, that isn't unique just to this district, that lower attendance. And the reason that I bring that up is there's a paradigm shift, I think, in the way that we look at the, the, the community assets of these schools. If we're going to continue to have a kind of bloated bureaucracy at the top administering all of these different government programs and requirements, we cannot sustain that when more and more of our investment doesn't make it to the classroom. And so I think there's a paradigm shift as a part of that. I think fundamentally, look, when you have a neighborhood school that's closing, you have a right to hear another idea, to have another option. Can somebody else bring a solution there? That's back to the marketplace of ideas. I'm not asking to give the legislature singularly all of the power, or me as a representative, to just dictate this school opens, this one closes. Let's go back to the last session though. I think the, the projection here in terms of closing these schools is to save over $5 million a year. A lot more than that was available in incremental funding and in fact, we wanted to make that investment and yet the priority has always been to prevent families from having a choice, from having a marketplace of ideas, from having an opportunity to escape a school that isn't meeting their needs. I encourage people often to think about not just themselves, but other neighbors, other Texans that might be in a school where the majority of children are not even learning to read. They should have an option. Think about them as well. Another thing I think we have to mention though is recapture. This is really a rebranding of the, the Robin Hood concept, which is frankly just a socialist redistribution mechanism. But that's what the state of Texas has set up for decades it, already. It's unacceptable. No one in our community accepts this as a reasonable way so to fund our education. The solution over time is to make a commitment that as we have these economic surpluses, we are going to focus the majority and a significant majority of that economic surplus to continue to compress and reduce the maintenance and operation property tax line item, which is the main mechanism through which this recapture takes place. That's over a billion dollars that's been taken, frankly stolen, from our community and then redistributed in a way that lacks transparency. And look, let me be clear, there are communities that lack resources, whereas a people, as a state of Texas, we should recognize that. And we can do that at the state level and help bring incremental funding there so that those children have an opportunity. But the way to accomplish that is not through this, this system that arbitrarily is taking from one, redistributing from another, and disenfranchising our local community from being able to determine their own, our own destiny in terms of the investment that we want to make in our own local schools. That's just not right. The only long-term solution is to really eradicate that m and property tax line. And that's not about lowering the funding. It's about taking the state surplus and using it to basically shift that investment away from that local level to the state where you don't have this take from one and give to the other. And by the way, yes, we have a high, uh, a high level of property value in Plano ISD, but there are plenty of Title I students, there are schools that are struggling with influxes of different populations. Let's not just look at this in this kind of bifocal way of you're either a rich or a poor district. It's much more nuanced than that. And this current system of recapture doesn't recognize that. It's unfair and it's ineffective. We need to have a conversation about this as a state. We need to go beyond this kind of every two years we talk about we want to get rid of it and then we don't do anything about it. I think that this broader discussion right now around the investment we make in education is the perfect opportunity to say, let's recognize this as a problem 
and get on a path to fix it for real because it's not working in the short term and in the long term for our state. So I want to ask you about teacher pay raises. Do you believe that the state, because obviously the local school districts determine how much they're paying their teachers. Yeah. Um, but do you believe it's time again, because they did it in 2019, for the state legislature to provide specified funding so that teachers can get a raise? Yes, I do believe that. And I think we have to understand the nature of the situation here. We've seen a rise in inflation. We've seen a growth in the administrative state. And often, a lot of the investment that the state makes isn't making it to the classroom. When I say the classroom, that's first and foremost the teacher. I think it's not only appropriate but necessary that we specifically direct that investment where it's most important, and that is to increasing teacher pay. We shouldn't have a situation where a superintendent can make more than the governor, can make three, four, and five hundred thousand dollars a year, and teachers are getting left behind and having their earnings eroded through inflation. There's a general sense that our most important investment in terms of, of the overall budget in education is to support our teachers, to attract and retain those teachers. I'm a firm believer in that. And I think we're in a situation where we do have to kind of have a directed investment in that because the fact of the matter is that we see less and less dollars making it down to that classroom level as more and more of this kind of bureaucracy has grown over time. Uh, last question on education, then I got some other topics. Yeah. Um, but as far as what I've heard critics say, and Democrats have said it, is that there are the, the private schools, if they get if the pri um, taxpayer funded education, savings accounts, vouchers, school choice, whatever you want to call it, if that passes, then the private schools are not held to the same standards as the public schools. And yet they're getting, in a way, tax dollars. What do you make of that? So it's a really good question, Jack. And I want to divide it into two different important answers. The first is when we think about accountability, the only real accountability is when you have to respond to an end user, to a customer that has the option to choose something else. The best accountability is the feedback you get from a market where people can simply tell you what you're doing is, is, is not good or un, unacceptable and we're going to vote with our feet, so to speak. That's actual accountability. The second thing I want to say is there are a number of things where, frankly, I think I agree with the school districts and a lot of Democrats in terms of a lot of the restrictions that we see in schools that are what I would really call a fake accountability. The number one is the STAR test. I haven't yet met a single person, I've talked to teachers, I've talked to parents, that believes in this high stakes testing regimen where you have a centralized government created test. In fact, I know that in Plano ISD, they will administer a nationally normed test, uh, the MAP test. Because it's more useful, you get quicker results, it's a shorter test. I support that, by the way, because it's a tool that actually helps them. Instead of having days or weeks misappropriated to this government testing regime, that really isn't about serving the students at the end of the day. And maybe more importantly, the people don't want it, and we should be representing the desires of the people. No private school, to my knowledge, administers the STAR test. That tells you everything that you need to know. Nearly all of them do administer a nationally normed test to give parents and teachers an idea of where that performance is compared to some peers. That makes perfect sense, but a lot of these tests are something you can take in a single day or a morning. It's not days and days and weeks and weeks. We need to get rid of that STAR test. Another one is providing funding based on enrollment versus attendance. I think that the spirit of this debate has been, a lot of people have had their hearts in the right place where we should say, look, we have an issue with truancy with attendance in some schools. And in order to hold them accountable, there should be a penalty if students aren't in the classroom uh, to incentivize an outreach, I guess, in the community to get better attendance. But look, at the end of the day, this significantly undermines the ability of somebody to operate a school when they're in the business of, of tracking all of this truancy, which frankly is the responsibility of the parents. And I think we need to recognize that. I'm not aware of any private school that charges you a tuition and then if your kid doesn't show up, they say, great, we'll refund you some of the money. It doesn't make any sense. So I think we can have a discussion about some of the real issues that schools are experiencing that we can do a better job at. Fundamentally, when I see a, a, a government mandate 
or an issue that undermines a school's efficacy. And they say, well, if we go to a system of school choice, the other schools don't have these same requirements. My first response is, should the requirement exist at all in the first place? When we can create a system with real accountability, which is at the local level, with parents, families, that local community having the right to choose what's working for them. Let's get the government out of that. We have a lot of debate around, do we have a left-wing curriculum and indoctrination in the schools? My fundamental response to that is not, well, then we should have a right-wing curriculum. It's why is the government at a centralized level, whether it's Austin or Washington, why are we in the business of managing the curriculum down at the local community level? Parents at the local level, empowered with choice, can work with their teachers in that school to deliver the best solution. Let's get the government out of that. I think everybody will be lifted up and performance will increase for everyone if we take that kind of approach and mindset. So you talked a little bit about property taxes. Uh, the Texas Comptroller's Office has set at the end of August 2025, mm -hmm. uh, the current biennium uh, is going to end with $16.7 billion in fund, fund balance, yep. surplus. Um, so do you think there should be more property tax relief you know, for property owners? And what about those who don't own property? Do they also deserve a break? I am a strong supporter of continuing to use the majority and a larger share, frankly, of that surplus to focus on property tax relief. I also believe that we should direct as much or all of it towards the maintenance and operation property tax line item. And a big reason that I believe that is, is part of what you just highlighted, that renters are being affected as well with this property tax issue. It, it affects everyone. I think we see a, a, a phenomenon here where inflation often is, is most damaging to those with the least um, uh, disposable income often also not property owners. The best way to provide that kind of relief is the most broad way, and that is through the compression of the M&O tax. And so that is what I, I intend to support. What I also wanna say about this is, I think it's important that we collectively come together and talk about, yeah, we have this, this surplus in the next legislature, but what is that long-term goal? That's back to eliminating that, that recapture and recognizing that this system of, um, of continuous appraisals going up and up and up simply isn't working. I think another important part of that is a, a bill that was in the last uh, legislature to require that any tax increase at the municipal or county level that's above the no new revenue rate go to the people, that the people have a right to have a referendum and vote on that. We're seeing this even in House District 70 where the state will reduce, will have property tax relief and then local jurisdictions come and raise their taxes. And on a net basis, people's taxes continue to go up. And I think that's a lot of the frustration that we see, where you meet someone at the door and we say, well, we gotta lower your taxes. Well, but every year they go up, right? They're not thinking about whether or not the M&O was compressed or the city tax. They're just looking at the dollars they paid out the door last year and this year and this year it's higher. They have a right to have more transparency there and to have more accountability with these different taxing jurisdictions. I think we need to pass that as part of a long-term solution of how we tell the people of Texas we need to commit to meaningful property tax relief. The current status quo is unacceptable. And look, I think what happened in the last legislative session was a bold step in the right direction. I want to be clear about that. It was a remarkable investment in property tax relief. And we should be, um, we should be thankful as a people of Texas that we're on that path now. We are clearly on a path of growing our, our economy through, uh, through a light touch regulatory regime. If we continue to have that strong economy, we're gonna have these surpluses. And we need to all come together and say, we're on that long-term path to really eliminate that m and tax, uh, property tax item, and give more of the power back to the people to, to not be surprised every couple of years of you know, what their tax rate's gonna be, and then have to go and, and dispute that. And I know people are fed up with that, I hear it every day. And so I think that that kind of long term commitment is where we need to shift this discussion to. But you're not talking about eliminating the property tax altogether, are you? There's a lot of debate around this, and I want to be clear with people. This is a long term problem. It's a long term solution. My focus and what I'm talking about here is specifically Schools. that maintenance and operations, because it is the largest item. 
where we can make the most progress, I think. This is also driven by the performance of the economy overall. It, it, there, there's not a silver bullet or magic wand where we can just eradicate property taxes, and that's not at all what I'm saying. Now, if you expand out to a far enough horizon, is that, is that possible? Is it something that we should talk about? I think it is, but it's already fairly ambitious to get on a path. I've heard estimates as low as six years to, uh, to eliminate m and I think it's probably closer to double that. It depends on the economy. We've got to continue to have that discussion. The comptroller provides a lot of good data around this, and, and that's what we need to focus on. So that, that's really what I'm proposing, is that we, we really start to make that promise to the people of Texas. We are on a path to eliminate that M&O tax. When we get there, let's continue to talk about you know, what the broader uh, landscape looks like in terms of how we fund our state and make the investments that we have to make. I do think that a piece of this, this uh, surplus does need to go into some critical water infrastructure. It's an important need in our state. And into ensuring that our electrical grid is, um, is positioned to respond better to emergencies and has more reliable power, which will bring costs down for everyone. Higher energy prices is taxes by another form. So we see critical long-term strategic investments that need to be made out of that surplus. The majority though, always, we have to make that promise to the people of Texas is going to property tax relief. And if we get on that path long-term, then we can continue to kind of evolve as we learn what does this look like overall in, in terms of that property tax relief that we can deliver. But again, m and tax focused, for, certainly for the near term, that would really be 100% of the, the relief I would be looking at. I did have one other topic to ask you about, and that was um, your opponent expressed concern that Republicans would try to take away uh, protections for IVF. Yeah. And said that she's very worried specifically that uh, about personhood laws, where frozen embryos would be given the same rights as people. Yeah. Um, where are you on this issue? I have never supported any restriction on IVF, and I will not do that. I've had dear friends and even family members that have expanded their families through that. This is a completely fabricated issue, and in fact, let's just be real because this is in the headlines recently, Ted Cruz at the federal level is trying to make that law to protect IVF, uh, and we've got a political game going on here of trying to point fingers when, when really we can solve this once and for all. I haven't heard any credible, serious advocacy from the people that I talked to in the district telling me I want IVF banned. Not that I would even support it if they did because I've seen that it's really a benefit for families to have that kind of opportunity. I understand there's some controversy around this, but this is just not something that we're going to do, ban IVF, completely fabricated political talking point, and I don't think we should be wasting the time of the people of HD70 with that. Steve Kennard, thank you so much. Jack, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.